give a bit of context, of course, it's uh, you know, architecture. Architecture in general is back on the agenda, and this is certainly very welcomed. Uh, it's only uh, you know, a few years ago the Eurozone was in a in somewhat of an existential angst, and, and, and this really shows how far we have come a lot recently, uh, 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 that this issue, this is issue is, is, is being you know, back on the agenda. Uh, 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 as a matter of fact, I, uh, I think it's often underestimated how far we have come already since the crisis in, in uh, building the architecture and building European institutions, uh, uh, not least so in the area of, of, of banking. There are other areas where there is pretty much work to be done. Uh, as we discussed uh, earlier today, uh, the, uh, there is the issue of, of the central fiscal capacity, and, and we have... Uh, uh, made some proposals in this regard uh, recently. Uh, Manager Director had a speech in, in Berlin last week where she detailed that proposal. But this is about banking union. I think this is a, a particularly uh, uh, relevant uh, sitting here in Spain that has had uh, uh, experience uh, uh, with, a, with, with, with a, uh, dealing with, with problem uh, banks. It's particularly important also because I think banking is one of the areas where there is a sense of, of a greater degree of political consensus on what could happen in the next couple of, of months. It's, um, at least that's my, my impression. So I think this is a very relevant uh, 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 topic uh, to conclude uh, the discussion today. And we are lucky we have uh, uh, four uh, uh, distinguished uh, uh, panelists uh, who have all been very much involved in, uh, in, uh, on the front line of, of the early tests of, of, of the banking union. Uh, we have uh, uh, Elke El Koenig, who has chaired the Single Resolution Board since its creation in 2014 and has overseen the resolution of Banco Popular and the liquidation of, of, of the Veneto banks in the summer of, of 2017. We have uh, 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 Gerd Jan Koopman, uh, Deputy Director uh, General in the GG Comp at the Commission, who plays an active role in, 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 in questions about state aid in the EU. Uh, and, and this, of course, an issue that takes center states in conversations about the banking architecture. And then uh, we have a, a small change. Uh, 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 Governor Linda, unfortunately, uh, is coming down with the flu and had to uh, uh, withdraw. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 the deputy, uh, deputy uh, Governor uh, uh, Alonso, who also has uh, 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 a lot of experience with, uh, with, with banking, uh, has, has agreed, uh, fortunately, to give the, the, the Bank of Spain perspective of, on, on the issue. And finally, we have Yves Mersch, uh, uh, member of the executive board of the ECB, uh, 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 who, uh, who, who oversees systemic uh, liquidity operations at the ECB, such as, as the ELA, and this is, of course, uh, an issue that overlaps very much the areas of crisis management. So let's get started. Now, contrary to the other sessions, we are not here uh, uh, asking the panelists to make presentations. I will ask a couple of, of questions uh, uh, and the panelists will re re reply and uh, 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 then at the end I will uh, open up for questions uh, uh, from the floor. So let's, let's start uh, uh, with, with you, Elke. Uh, 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 the single resolution board uh, was tested on two important uh, 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 occasions last year. First, the resolution of Banco Popular in Spain, and second, the liquidation of two Venetian banks in Italy. Against this backdrop, how do you see the functioning of the banking union today? What has already been achieved, and which aspects should be prioritized to complete the banking union? That's quite a long question. How much time do you have? Uh, let me perhaps start. I think you could even expand it. We have been now tested in total four times. In one case, Banco Popular, we decided that that bank had critical functions, was systemic for financial stability, and therefore we took a resolution action. In a couple of weeks later, in two Italian cases, we came to the conclusion that these banks had no interconnectedness anymore, I would say, with the basically Italian financial system, they had no critical functions and would not pose a threat to financial stability for the country or the union as a whole. And therefore, normal insolvency procedures would be the way to go. 
And uh, the same we did this year in February, when in a case of a fairly small compared by standards when you compare it to popular uh, bank called ABLB in Latvia, that bank was fa declared failing or likely to fail. And in that case, even our resolution plan had already stated that we would not see that there is a critical function of financial stability threat. So basically, we handed it into normal insolvency procedure. What does it tell you? Resolution is not the rule. It's the exception to the rule. And part of what the banking union, for me, needs to achieve is really to make sure that also banks can fail like any other institution in an economy. But you asked a bit broader, and I take the liberty to answer. I think we need to be fair. The banking union was created under pressure, but in record speed. The single supervisory mechanism, Javier can report about that, is now up and running for a bit less, more than three years. We are really, as a resolution authority, up and running now for a bit more than two years. I think the cooperation there is well established. There is one leg to this banking union missing, that's called ADIS, so a joint European deposit system. But at the same time, I think we also need to acknowledge that you can't do everything in one go, or as we would say, achieving resolvability, we have to work together, and it takes a bit of time. MREL, the European version of TLEC, needs to be set up quantity-wise, quality-wise, but you can't do that just with switching on the light. Impediments to be addressed, which goes from data availability. I'm always saying when banks complain that the liability data template, we give them only two months to fill in. Well, in case of a resolution, we need the information immediately and the like. And there are still some missing pieces and some legacy to be addressed in the system. But overall, I think Banco Popular and I know all about the uh, concerns and about the write-ups, but I think Banco Popular was proof that the framework is fit for purpose. The bank was resolved without issues to financial stability, without issues to critical functions. So overall, I think it's, we have standard test, the first test. I don't want to have too many repetitions. That's why we're working on resolution planning that hopefully will avoid the one or the other resolution because there are other avenues to go. I would stop here, but not to Rec jeopardize. Rec recognizing that it will take, take uh, time uh, to complete the banking, what, what, what do you consider the sort of the priorities, the, the immediate priorities? What are the immediate priorities for us? to really have resolution plans for each and every bank and to continue to have the needed MRAL set and possible impediments to be addressed. I'm always using it and saying when being a bit accused that it takes so long to address this that no responsible bank management needs to wait for our letters. I think bank managements know what needs to be done. The same holds true on addressing legacy issues like NPLs. When it goes to call it the architecture and with that more to legislators, then I think the, topic, the two topics I'm seeing are, or the two, three topics are ADIS, as I mentioned, so to, to finalize the banking union to that extent, then to address the missing piece of at least our triangle, which I would say is the resolution framework, fit for purpose, it is still missing, and insolvency laws. For us, the counterfactual is always insolvency law. Now, we have to acknowledge we have 19 different insolvency laws, and meaning that we have more than 19 different insolvency procedures. So, the counterfactual to a resolution means something different in different member states. That's the one area. Or, when we don't take a resolution decision, 
you might find yourself in a situation that you don't find the easy plug to say no resolution, but national insolvency. And then to make sure that national insolvency is really happening. And you can link it even to one more topic, which is the NPL topic, a fit for purpose insolvency regime, a fit for purpose judicial process is also helping to improve and enhance the value of NPLs and making those resolvable. So that's an area to work on. The other area to work on is internal between us. We have a framework of DG competition, which is called the banking communication. We have the BRID and SRMR. And I think we need to make sure that also there the incentives are well aligned. And last but not least, the topic for us to be to address together with the Commission, but also together with the central banks, is funding and resolution. We were lucky in the case of Banco Popular that we had a solvent and liquid buyer, but the entire resolution framework is more geared towards addressing solvency issues, not liquidity issues. So bail-in can restore the capital base, but bail-in does not provide any cent of liquidity on Monday morning. So that's a topic we need to address. There, the single resolution fund, we can play a role, in particular if we have the backstop, but this would always be too little for any real systemic bank, and I'm not even sure whether it's the wisest use. So that is why, totally controversial with the ECB, we would think there is a role for central banks to play and for us together to find solutions. I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, perhaps I could move on to, to uh, Deputy Governor Alonso. Uh, 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 to give us the, the, the perspective uh, from, from, from Spain. You, uh, you have been here at the Bank of Spain through a challenging time, uh, uh, seeing Spain emerge from the crisis and confronting problems of systemically important banks. Uh, uh, so fr from, from your perspective, uh, uh, what aspects of, 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 of the still incomplete banking union are, are sort of most of, of concern uh, to the Spanish authorities? concern and the more relevant one is that we have not yet completed the banking union as Elke mentioned we are still missing the European Depositors Insurance Scheme uh, we believe that uh, if a bank is supervised by a single uh, uh, supervisory mechanism, if it's resolved under uh, a single resolution board, if in both cases we are following European rules why the depositors will, in case of uh, insolvency and liquidation, they will have to be covered by national uh, depositors, deposit uh, insurance schemes. Uh, we believe that it will be very relevant to finish uh, this third pillar of the banking junior as soon as possible. We believe that that it will uh, equalize uh, the depositors' confidence in the banking system it will help to de-link the, the link existing between the banks and the uh, sovereigns. And finally, it will help the level playing field uh, for the, all the customers in the banking uh, union. The second concern, which is a consequence for the first one, is that uh, well, we, let's say, we agree with the initial proposal of the Commission of uh, creating of, uh, an EDIS with three steps. First, it was uh, the reinsurance. The second step was going to be co-insurance. And the third step was going to be full insurance. However, uh, in the autumn of last year, there was another new proposal from the European Commission, uh, which is only having two steps. The first one is uh, uh, reinsurance. The second one, but subject to conditionality among, among that, uh, those uh, conditions, is another AQR. And it's not very clear when it's going to be the third step, the full, uh, the full uh, insurance. And we believe 
that we need a fully fresh insurance uh, just to complete the banking union. So those are our two main concerns. Are there, are there any, uh, no, you, you have, uh, uh, you have gone through uh, the, uh, the, the Bank of Bula, uh, case. Are there, are there any key lessons from that that could help uh, sort of expedite uh, the completion of the banking union? Well, I think that, as I can mention, from that experience, uh, what we have learned is that we need to clarify uh, for the future the two questions. One is the, about the liquidity, uh, perhaps both before resolution and after resolution. And then, uh, well, uh, I think that uh, linked to that is also the question of if there are enough funds uh, from the European Resolution Fund to, uh, let's say, to tackle a problem uh, of a medium-sized bank, because I believe that there, is, there will be uh, more money needed. And I think that one of the lessons after that is that those are problems that should be uh, well, solved in the future. Mm -hmm. So that leads you know, into to the, to the question uh, for you. Uh, uh, are there ways to strengthen the framework for emergency liquidity assistance at the national central banks, uh, uh, for instance, by harmonizing the collateral framework? Uh, how, how can resolution financing be strengthened? Well, I think uh, I would start by setting out uh, exactly why the different institutions here have been set up. And that is uh, a very important starting point. And uh, who, uh, some have been set up by the legislator through uh, secondary legislation, and some, like the ECB, have been set up through primary legislation through constitutional changes in many countries. And uh, the central bank is one such institution. We do monetary policy. We have not in our mandate uh, to do resolution. We do not have uh, in our mandate uh, to do deficit financing. Also, we heard during the conference that uh, monetary financing might be a very easy way to do away with excessive uh, debt. Um, that is exactly what was forbidden when the treaty establishing the ECB was set up. So that is a starting point. Now, you also mentioned uh, emergency liquidity assistance. When the ECB was set up, um, we left emergency liquidity assistance at the local level because at that time it was considered that um, the proximity uh, of the supervision and uh, the emergency liquidity provisioning uh, was uh, at the local level. Now, in the meantime, we have uh, brought uh, the European uh, single supervisory mechanism into being, and the question arises. Uh, whether why we still have uh, emergency liquidity assistance left with the central banks, the national central banks. Well, the answer is because, uh, according to our analysis, ELA, or emergency liquidity assistance, is a financial stability function and not a monetary policy function. We only check whether there is no interference that would occur through this national money creation at the European level. But for the rest, uh, financial stability remains a national competence. Mm -hmm. We only have financial stability concerns that address the whole euro area, which has to some extent been transferred to the ECB. The treaty says very clearly that uh, in financial stability, the ECB only contributes to the actions that are taken by the competent authorities, which means that we are not the competent authority, even though the legislator has said that we are a designated authority, which in some cases can also contribute. So this is very clearly different objectives. And uh, if there is a national competence, it is very difficult to harmonize national competencies if there is not a mandate to do so. So when it comes to collateral, for example, you mentioned that harmonizing collateral framework for ELA. 
we have no information. We have a data base for eligible collateral for monetary policy. And that is what we call adequate collateral according to a framework that has been set up since 99 and which is public. When it comes to giving emergency liquidity, there is no framework. Because ELA is giving not against adequate collateral, but against what is called sufficient collateral. And what is sufficient is determined at the national level. And there is not even a single database that says what is acceptable in one country and what is not acceptable in another one. Because the availability of collateral which is not monetary policy eligibility, eligible is hugely divergent amongst countries. And that's why it is a measure of the National Central Bank which is also responsible for it. And there is no risk sharing in emergency liquidity also. So those are the reasons why it has been very difficult to establish even a semblance of a framework when it comes to emergency liquidity assistance. We have tried at least to make the framework public as of short. We have also tried um, to uh, be more specific uh, on the length of uh, the liquidity assistance. Don't forget that in 92 when the, or 91, when we negotiated the Maastricht Treaty, ELA, emergency liquidity, was considered to be negligible. It was considered to be given only for 24 hours, and then it could be rolled over. Well, nowadays we understand that in some countries, 24 hours can be rolled over more than a thousand times in a row. Uh, is that still, uh, then come questions to what extent does this interfere then with centralized money creation and monetary policy. And there we have built up uh, over time a certain jurisdiction, uh, what we accept and what cannot be accepted. The last point, resolution. Resolution was set up by the government because it's about restructuring a bank. Structural policy is not in the mandate of monetary policy. So how can we be forced to finance a government task? This would be the same as financing a deficit. It's monetary financing. So we cannot be forced to finance resolution. I understand that there is a need for liquidity in uh, the aftermath of a weekend resolution, for example, and that uh, on Monday morning a bank uh, might not have sufficient collateral either because the resolution was not uh, convincing to the market or uh, that uh, for other reasons uh, the market does not trust it. That is exactly why the government established the need for the uh, SRF for having a fund but the fund is not yet operational. It's being set up after too many years. It's also in times of volume. It might be questioned. And that's why the question of a backstop arose. But the backstop cannot be central bank financing because uh, central bank financing would violate, one, the independence of the central bank. It would violate, two, monetary financing. It would violate, three, that we only can operate according to a functioning market economy. Now, I give you one example. Some program countries have been shut off the market. Now, at one stage, and that's why we also did not buy those securities from those governments, but at a certain moment after their program was nearly completed, they returned to the market. So they asked the central bank, it would be nice that you would help us recover market access. And why don't you give an insurance that you buy our first issuance up or a big share of it? We said we cannot do this because this is market access funding which is not in accordance with the market economy. You must first prove that you are able to issue in the markets and have a track record and only afterwards can you participate in our monetary policy uh, 
asset uh, purchase program. And the same logic should, in my opinion, that applies to the sovereign. Why would it not apply to a bank? Why would we discriminate between the banks and the sovereign? So, again, to sum up, I will not rule out that a bank that is eligible for monetary policy, a bank that means it must have a license, it must respect the, all the ratios, uh, it must respect the solvency definition uh, that uh, unfortunately we have four different definitions and uh, only a couple of weeks ago we have managed to reduce them to three because a supervisor now uses a forward-looking dynamic version of uh, what is solvent for a bank in order to align it uh, with uh, the state aid uh, definition but we still have different solvency definitions when it comes to emergency liquidity assistance. And that is again different from who is eligible to participate in monetary policy, what we call uh, the, uh, the banks uh, which are financially sound. And in order to be financially sound, we again rely on a different solvency definition. So we still have work ahead of us. We are working on it. We are looking into it. I do not deny that there is an issue with liquidity in resolution. But it cannot be that every problem that we find in the EU is put at the door of the central bank because we have to respect the values and the principles that are enshrined in our constitution. Sorry for being so long. Thank you. Uh, Elke, uh, you have a reaction? Yeah, I'll, I, then I would at least take one problem off your door and that was there was never an intention to have the backstop to the single resolution fund funded by the central bank. That was never ever on the table. The backstop to the single resolution fund is hopefully coming from the ESM, and if that's not the agreement, well then I would look around for member states and go around with my head to collect the money. But I have never thought of the ECB for this, just not to give a wrong impression. Uh, Governor, you have any reaction to this? Yeah. Well, uh, for us it will be a case-by-case -case, uh, assessment uh, and uh, if uh, we have in our statute also the wording that we can only give uh, financing against adequate collateral. Now, uh, we have always considered that adequate collateral, uh, which is translated in Spanish in um, the plural of um, Garantias adequadas, uh, and in all languages except in French, it is in the plural, means that we need a collateral that consists of a security that is negotiable, that is tradable, and that is, uh, has also been assessed in the markets. Now, some people seem to believe that we could replace such uh, a guarantee by a standing guarantee of an institution. I don't know to what extent uh, the uh, single resolution board intends to borrow or to issue uh, uh, guarantees and to what extent uh, what would be the, uh, the rating of such guarantees, uh, but then there were also reflections whether the ESM could not provide uh, such a guarantee. But a standing guarantee by definition is not one that is tradable, negotiable and assessed uh, at the market price. So these are all issues that need to be discussed, that need to be overcome, and to, have to, to see uh, to what extent we need to move. But that by definition, we have said resolution is a government task and not a central bank task, but we do not rule out that individual cases, if a bank fulfills all the conditions of our framework for monetary policy, it can participate. Do you have any, any reaction to this discussion? Um, <laughs> it might be a long discussion, but uh, <laughs> I understand perfectly. I know the rules of the ECB. I also know the limits of the reality. And I think that if a bank is big enough, and uh, after a night of resolution, uh, the customers continue to withdraw money, there is only one source of money that could be available at 9 o'clock in the morning, Monday morning, which is central bank money. How? That's another matter. It could be that the buyer could receive a guarantee from the European Resolution Fund, and against that guarantee, 
that bank could borrow in the central bank. It could be that there's resolution finance issue in bonds, which are placed in other banks, which could raise money to lend to the buyer. There are many other things, but, and I think that one of the concerns with the popular is that the size of the bank was quite big, the outflows were quite big, and the liquidity next day was, let's say, uh, potentially of a big concern. But that's, okay, it's not, no, I think it's fair to say if we don't find a really convincing answer to funding in resolution, well then, on the one hand, we should save our efforts and let the bank go into insolvency because we can't provide a real solution, probably not what is our mandate. And I would ask at least the central bankers to pause a bit because we, you made a comment on ELA, uh, as a framework, one thing is for sure, if out of financial stability consideration you come to a resolution, you restore the capital base, the bank on Monday is definitely more solvent than the bank on Friday was, and the bank on Sun Monday unfortunately doesn't have more pledgeable assets than they had on Friday. But if we then say, well, we have a good framework, but now we lack the lender of last resort for this kind of transaction, I think we have not done our homework. So I take it as a promising sign that also you, Eve, say we need to work on this and to find a solution. And that's probably all we can achieve here. We, we have already, to some extent, imagine the question of the government guarantees uncovered bank bonds, where we have said we don't accept that the bank who have issued such bonds presents it to the central bank for financing. Yes. But we accept it if they sell it to another bank, and that bank presents it but to But to us. be fair, this for me is a very dangerous tool, but it just, because it just reinforces the nexus between the sovereign and the bank, and they are issued before resolution, which could get you more into the question when it's too early, but when it's obviously too late, because you are just creating a spiral that makes the problem just more expensive, and you're bailing in the state in the end. I think, Elke, one important point, uh, that is, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that when we started with ELA, we considered that would be 24 hours, mm -hmm. and uh, we are now saddled uh, with cases uh, where it is for more than three years. So uh, if we would uh, unconditionally accept any resolution bank to be financed by us, Indefinitely, uh, I think that would create moral hazard. It would be, to some extent, uh, letting the resolution board of the hook as well, uh, because we would automatically stand behind and we would be the real backstop. And I think that is not in the spirit of the decision making and of the treaty nor of the regulation. And I think there we agree, sir can agree that we are not looking for a sugar daddy. We just look for a solution to have the funding solved. And to be fair, when you look at what the Americans have in place, but in particular when you look at what the Bank of England has put in place, I would yeah. argue, but then I think we should not get into more and more turns, that having something in place is to some extent protecting you against using it. I'm fairly realistic. If we have a very sizable bank and we need to resolve it over the weekend, we talk again. No, no, but you, <laughs> but you know that the Bank of England is not under the same independent rule as the ECB Perfectly nor fine. the Fed. Yeah. And the Bank of England benefits from the standing guarantee of government in this case. Yeah. Well, uh, perhaps we can come back to this. Uh, I, I want to, uh, I want to, uh, this is a fascinating discussion. Uh, I want to move on to the perspective of GTCOM. Uh, 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 GTCOM and its role uh, in policing state aid to the EU take a center stage in conversations about the banking architecture. 
This is an area that bears on positions in bank resolution and liquidation, precautionary recapitalization, and political support for NPL cleanup. Uh, in this, this regard, uh, there are many who have uh, uh, argued that uh, risk reduction should go hand in hand with risk sharing. Key element of risk uh, reduction is addressing the still high level of, uh, of, of NPLs. Uh, at the same time, NPL sales to interested buyers could occur at large haircuts to book value, potentially generating recapitalization needs with implications for state aid. Could you please elaborate for us on how the state aid issue could be addressed while helping to create a market for banks to offload NPLs? Yes, thank you, Paul. Let, let me take a step back um, in terms of the functioning of state aid control in banking union. It, it's worth maybe recalling that uh, prior to the entry into force of banking union, banks that run into difficulty were essentially restructured or closed down with state aid. And uh, all of that was processed uh, through uh, the state aid rules, which led to DG Competition de facto playing the role that LP is now playing and covering about a third of the banking uh, sector in Europe over the past uh, eight years. Now, with Banking Union, we have, uh, in principle, uh, 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 an excellent legal framework to deal with this, and our role, therefore, should uh, diminish. But the legislators have perceived, nevertheless, an important uh, uh, function uh, for uh, state aid uh, control that has two faces. The first is that, in essence, whenever state aid is given to a bank, it should fail. It mm -hmm. should be declared uh, to fail, and therefore we have to police uh, whether an intervention by the government is actually uh, on market terms or whether it uh, entails state aid. And this is highly relevant in the context of NPL transactions, where many uh, uh, governments and banks uh, uh, pass our uh, offices and say, listen, we have these NPLs, but actually they're worth uh, 40 cents to the euro. Uh, surely the state can buy them at 40 cents. That's a market price, uh, uh, and there is no need for any further uh, uh, resolution or uh, uh, liquidation insolvency uh, intervention. It's then, uh, unfortunately, our task to say, hold on a second, are you actually sure that 40 cents is a market price, or are you implicitly, by inflating the price, you are giving uh, uh, for these NPLs uh, 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 giving state aid, and therefore should, should this bank not uh, fall under uh, Elka's uh, 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 bailiwick. Now, that's something that uh, uh, is enshrined in legislation, mm -hmm. and it is not as such a state aid issue. It's an issue that falls, uh, fl flows directly from the banking union rules. Mm -hmm. So the banking union rules have said state aid means uh, uh, failing or likely to fail, and that can either mean resolution or liquidation. So what we do is we look at ways in which we can help member states design market conform interventions um, to uh, uh, offload uh, NPLs. We've done that in Italy through the uh, so-called GAX uh, uh, initiative, which essentially allows the state to guarantee at market rates a senior tranche in a, in a portfolio transaction. We've had other uh, uh, market-based uh, uh, interventions in this context, but it's fair to say that NPLs typically uh, uh, imply big losses for banks when, when, when they're off, uh, offloaded from the balance sheet. And therefore, by virtue of the banking union legislation, not because of state aid rules, uh, uh, there are more limits now outside of resolution or liquidation. And that's a good thing because it breaks the nexus between uh, the sovereign and uh, uh, the banks. Now, the second role we have is, in essence, to make sure that when, under the new banking union rules, state aid can be given, and there are some exceptions for this, they are given in a way that uh, uh, leads to outcomes that do not distort competition too much and that return whatever comes out of this intervention to a, an entity that is, that is viable. And this is essentially the case of a precautionary recap, where we've, we've had the, the example of the oldest bank of Europe, Monte Paschi di Siena, uh, last year. And it's also the case of situations where uh, state aid is given in, in, in liquidation where we have to make sure that it actually is necessary. That's a prior condition for giving state aid. It has to be necessary for, for serving a common interest objective, and that it's minimized and that it doesn't distort competition. So against that background, we, we've had uh, eight interventions, uh, eight commission decisions over the past two years, uh, and we're, we're presently looking at these decisions. We're also looking at the one resolution case that, that took place to see what uh, uh, lessons uh, we, we need to draw from that going forward. 
I think final point in this context, it's important to realize that the cases we're dealing with today are essentially legacy cases. If you look at the distribution of NPLs across member states, you will see a very uneven picture where NPLs are largely concentrated in four jurisdictions that were hard hit by the crisis and where there are uh, uh, legacy issues that need to be dealt with. And I think it's fair to say that these transitional issues pose a particular challenge for the banking union, for, for state aid control. And I think we're trying with Elke and with Danielle at the SSM to manage this as best as possible. Uh, and I think if you look at a country like Italy, which went through you know, quite a significant adjustment in 2017, then the fact that these NPLs have come down so significantly shows that uh, the system is actually delivering reductions uh, and that uh, uh, with or without state aid, uh, uh, effective uh, progress uh, can be realized. Are they, uh, they are this ongoing discussion about national level asset management companies. Are there any, uh, uh, do you have any views here on, 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 on how that would fit, fit with state aid rules? Well, the, the Commission just published a, a, a blueprint uh, mm -hmm. which sets out what the legally available options are. And uh, as I said before, in principle, either states can intervene uh, by giving uh, market confirmed prices for NPLs. But obviously that uh, uh, limits the uh, intervention possibilities because that means that banks have to take big losses. Uh, and, and that flows from the banking union rules. Or alternatively, in the case of so-called precautionary recaps, uh, states can also uh, 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 use the so-called precautionary uh, uh, aid budget. So the, uh, the, the unlikely losses that, uh, that, that a bank may uh, uh, incur in a stress test to uh, uh, subsidize uh, NPL uh, removals. But those are the only two possibilities that, that, that remain in banking union landscape. As I said before, this is not a consequence of the state aid rules, this is a consequence no. of the banking union rules. So, no, to, to all of you, for outsiders, uh, isn't this, isn't the whole European setup really complicated? We have the ECB monetary <laughs> policy, we have the SRB, we have the SSM, we have DGCOM and uh, other functions of the Commission. Uh, 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 isn't it just too complex? Well, I, I think it's, it's definitely complex, uh, and as Eve has reminded us, this is partly because of the, the constitutional order of the Union. But I think the good news is that it works. Yes. And I think that's really important, because we can easily get distracted in long debates about who does what and, you know, is it, is it not overly complex. To some extent, these are constitutional limitations no one in this room can any, do anything about. But I think the real question is, is it delivering the goods? And I think the answer is, yes, it's delivering the goods, maybe imperfectly so, but we're moving towards a new equilibrium. And uh, let me say that in this new equilibrium, I am pretty sure that the role DG competition will play will be much smaller, because the new equilibrium will be much more stable, it will be much more embryo, so that if get, banks get into trouble, it will be much easier for Elke to resolve them. And uh, by that time, I'm sure that the uh, funding of uh, uh, <laughs> resolution issue will have been resolved, so we will, uh, we will be playing a much smaller role at that juncture. I was always thinking that I'm an optimist by nature, but I seem to be surrounded by more optimists. So, no, let me be, but let me agree with uh, Gedjan. I have heard numerous times this is a very complex system, and when you read through it, and with all the approvals, I think one member of the European Parliament said, will it ever work? First of all, we proved it doesn't even just work over a resolution weekend. You can do it on a Tuesday evening, though I would not recommend to repeat it on a Tuesday evening. It's just very short night. The second part is we need to acknowledge we are a union of, in the banking union, of 19 independent member states. So there is some areas, like I mentioned, insolvency law, where I would urge legislators to take a step forward and to harmonize, but we have 19 independent member states. But as I said, it proved to work and to contrast it a bit with the US, we have an exercise called the trilateral exercise between the UK as a non-banking union, EU country still, the US and us. When we did our mock exercise, what if we have to resolve one of our GSIPs? And I just counted the number of agencies around the table from the US 
Compared to that, Europe seems to be a very lean organization. It was only the ECB, the European Commission, and us at the table. So it's all relative. And I think we've proven it can work, and you can improve it further. Julia, any common the complexity? Well, uh, from the experience of the resolution of Banco Popular, yes, it was very complex. It was also the first time, and we have to learn from scratch. But I would say that the good thing is that the communication was uh, very good, was excellent. Uh, it's true that, uh, well, uh, things were solved in uh, one night, uh, not in a weekend. So probably a weekend would, would have been much longer time to resolve the bank if uh, that could have been possible. But even in one night, uh, it could be done. We have uh, a bank which uh, was uh, no need of uh, public support. Uh, it was functioning perfectly the following day. Uh, it fulfilled the basic uh, functions. So I think that, yes, it was very complex. It was difficult, but it was done. I would add that if you look uh, at the institutional setup in Europe, uh, it's even more complex because in each member country, the setup is again different. In some countries, resolution authority has been given to the central bank. Now, in our opinion, we said this is possible when they only administer for a third party for the government uh, the resolution, but they cannot finance it for the reasons I said before. Uh, the financial stability authority in some countries is the central bank, in other countries it's the supervisor, in third countries it's even the minister of finance. So uh, this again is different from one country to another. But I agree with what Elke said. In comparison to other jurisdictions which only have one treasury, we are not overly complex. And uh, what is important is we know where we go and we are condemned to succeed. Now, what makes the thing a little bit more complex in terms of resolution is we have had no resolution which for the moment has not yet ended in front of the court. We have a lot of court cases and that makes the thing even more uncertain and complicated. But we are at the very beginning. Imagine where we were in all our countries only uh, five or ten years ago. In most countries there was no resolution authority. In most countries, there was hardly a functioning pre-funded deposit insurance scheme. In many countries, um, the supervision was very divergent and split and uh, was interpreting European directives in very divergent ways. By the way, we still have too many options and national discretion. So I think we still have uh, a way to go ahead of us, but I would again say, don't underestimate the close cooperation that exists between the different functions at the European level and the will to coordinate also the national level in, also in order to bring Europe forward to where we want it to be. Thank you. Well, I would just like to pick up what you said. We are ending and we are faced with quite an avalanche of lawsuits now after the resolution. But I would say this was to be expected. This is the first case, of course, and of course, unlike in supervision, I've said that no long before I joined the SRB, unlike in supervision, when you have a resolution case, those that have been bailed in or where liabilities have been uh, converted have see only upside to go to the court to see for the right. Now, I would expect the first cases are solving the first and the second and the third question here, so you get to a more kind of a case law over time. But I would always expect that resolution, unlike supervision, normally ends in courts to find out where the options are. Now, there, again, our system is, we have 19 member states. So you have a bit the menu of options, whether you go national or you go to the European court. I think the system is fairly simple, but it will end. I don't find it a proof that the system doesn't work, but the logical consequence of any resolution decision. 
No, I, I think if I may add one thing, you know, if you compare this with the states, uh, uh, we have a system that resolves big institutions. In yes. the state, it's the other way around. Uh, in, in essence, the FDIC deals with smaller, smaller institutions de facto, and they also end up uh, before the courts uh, uh, very frequently. So, as Elke said, it's about allocating losses. If we take on big, big banks uh, and their big losses, and so far the losses have been relatively small in the Paul Pollard mm -hmm. case, but if we have a, a big bank where there is a deep bail-in, then there will be very significant uh, losses, and naturally people who are concerned will seek uh, redress uh, before the courts. That's yes. simply par for the courts. Well, it's their good right, and so we have to deal with it. Uh, I'm going to open up uh, for questions from the floor. Uh, any, any questions? Yes, I, I have a question to, to Mr. Mesh. Um, if I remember correctly, in, in 2000, in the, during the first uh, Article 4 report of the IMF about the Euro area, one of the major concerns that were raised by the IMF at that time was the lack of a lender of last resort uh, structure in the Euro system. At that time, the ECB reacted in public, reassuring the IMF and the public opinion in general by indicating that the ECB understood that it was a function that is going to be at the core of the ECB. It's, in, it's, it's written, I remember perfectly, and indicated that the ELA provisions and internal arrangements uh, in, in the Euro system were going to cater for that. By, by listening to you now, I, I, I got the impression that, that the position of the ECB may have changed over time since, since the early days of the monetary union. I am right? I would say, if you ask my personal opinion, I would say the case for a centralized uh, emergency liquidity or lender of last resort function has rather increased. But uh, my personal preference does not say anything about the political feasibility, which I do not think has much evolved since 2000 or 1999. So to say I was very encouraged by the panelists and the, the optimism about the completion and the need to complete the, the banking union, um, including on the, on the European deposit insurance. Um, and it's clearly uh, a thing, but when I go and talk to uh, some German officials uh, or I talk to some, uh, let's call it Northern European officials, they still uh, bring up some concerns be on legacy issues, non-performing exposures, it is still high. It is declining in countries like Italy, it's still, it's still high and there's a few countries, but they're still quite high, I would say. There's the concern about the links between banks and sovereigns. Uh, if you take Italy and Spain, most of the sovereign exposure is in domestic sovereign, bonos, Spanish banks, or PTPs, Italian banks, of course, even the incentives and the higher yield, it only makes sense, but it's a concern, um, I would guess. It's not ideal from the risk diversification perspective. Um, other things that are raised is related to the insolvency regimes, the 19 insolvency regimes, and the slow recovery on problem loss, especially in cases like Italy, uh, which also slows down the process of uh, producing non-performing exposures, and then issues related to the way buildings have been applied. Um, so when I put all this on the table, do you see this as Conditions that need to be sorted out before banking union happens, or do you feel that enough progress has been done and banking union is close enough, it's around the corner, it's only months away? Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think mm -hmm. still needs to be done to, to uh, bring some comfort to those concerns in Northern Europe, Germany, and the West? I can try to give it an answer. I know that the debate about EDIS in my home country is not the most popular on this planet, uh, to put it mildly. And I understand the concern of some, let's say, I would say not 
you have to deliver all risk reduction first, and then you can consider, but to see that risk reduction happens at least in parallel too. So I'm coming now from the other end in saying when you look at the banking union, and that was the architectural question here, we have a solid first pillar called SSM. We have, I hope, also solid a second pillar called the SRM. But to make it a truly European system, you need to ensure that if there is a risk remaining, which is depositors and the, with that the deposit insurance system, that this also becomes a European answer. So the same kind of protection, but actually also for the member states, not the worry, and I think we could hear that after the case of, resolution, of the resolution of Banco Popular, that the Portuguese colleagues, we were always considering that the Portuguese subsidiary goes together with the Spanish parent, but still the Portuguese authorities said, yeah, but what if not? Well, then Portuguese depositors would have fallen on the Portuguese deposit guarantee system, Spanish depositors on the Spanish. So to make it really European, you need ADIS to complete. And I think it's now up to legislators or the co-legislators to make sure that this system moves forward, risk reduction, also needs to move forward. And there are some topics where I think, when, if not now, do you want to address them? The sun is shining, at least it was when I came. Yeah, this, this, I, I, I would not maybe say that on this one the sun is already uh, at, uh, at summer altitude, uh, but no. uh, uh, it is definitely shining. And I, I think it's important just to pick up on a point that the Deputy Governor raised a, a minute ago. I think the Commission's proposal on EDIS uh, uh, last year was not meant to call into question the endpoint. It's very important to, to, to underline mm -hmm. that. But it was simply a recognition of the reality, which uh, also uh, David Lipton uh, expressed uh, earlier in his keynote mm -hmm. speech, that you know, if, if you have some member states where the NPL ratio is 45%, uh, and, and you're a member state where the NPL ratio is 2%, you know, there is a, a bit of an issue of actuarial equivalence uh, if you look at this. Mm -hmm. so, so what the Commission mm -hmm. has proposed is simply a phasing, in essence, to allow member states to demonstrate exactly what Elke has said, that as we pool these risks, uh, uh, the risks are also reduced in those uh, 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 constituencies where they are very high. And I think that is a sensible way forward. I don't think this should be read as uh, the, the Commission capitulating uh, before impossible political uh, pressures. I also don't think it is very helpful to put member states who are concerned about this from a, a risk equivalence point of view into a corner, nor is it very helpful to, uh, uh, to, to, to claim that we should first have all banks at 1% NPL before we move forward with risk sharing. So you, you obviously need a trajectory, a transitional mm -hmm. path. I think the proposal that has been put on the table has, has definitely helped catalyze the discussion a little bit. We're not there yet. I'm not sure this is going to be the end point, but we definitely need to press forward. And again, I think ultimately we have to look at what is happening in those uh, constituencies where the NPL ratios are the highest. In Italy, they've gone down by a quarter last year. Even in Greece, they're going down now. So, so that is all very tangible progress, and I'm sure that will help uh, reach uh, the, uh, uh, the end point of, uh, of a truly integrated EDIS. Yes, please. Thank you. So, also on Ella and funding resolution, sometimes it looks like if we see these two debates as separate, but in fact, they are very much linked because normally when a bank reaches resolution, there are significant Ella positions already there. So, the question is how to transform this central bank financing into funding from the resolution authority, probably, probably with the backstop of the ESM and to ensure a smooth transition and to facilitate market access. But it's surprising to me that instead of this, we are thinking about other tools like the moratorium, which is, I think, quite dangerous in a, in a, fragmented, uh, in a fragmented banking union where uh, precisely for the lack of eddies, funds can be transferred very rapidly from one country to another 
and then if you use this type of, of tool in a, in a particular bank, you may create contagion to other banks in the, in the same country. So my, my point is, um, shouldn't we really try to address the question of liquidity instead of introducing tools that in a way goes back to well, the, the beginning of central banks actually, which is the role of lender of last resort. I mean, other countries have, as you, as you have mentioned, easy solutions like the Bank of England. Of course, in Europe, in the Eurozone, we have an additional complexity. But to me, the moratorium proposal is, uh, is quite dangerous uh, with the experience we had in the fragmentation of the Eurozone in, in 20, 2012. Uh, I think I would like to disentangle moratorium from funding and resolution. Uh, might be the fact that I'm coming from a member state that has for decades a moratorium tool in its toolbox makes me less adverse to that tool. For me, the moratorium tool is just one tool that might be used, now we have slight divergences there, but that might be used at the brick of failing or likely to fail into having the resolution scheme adopted or having the bank in put into insolvency. So it's a tool for a limited number of days, not to be used mandatory, but for very specific situations, just to avoid a first mover advantage or smart money moving out at this point. So it should be fairly short period of time and then holistic, so covering all deposits. I don't see so much the risk that this could then trigger other banks because I think that's anyhow for all of us an obligation to make sure that if we have a bank that goes into resolution that we make in most cases, and I think 99% of the cases will be of this kind, that this is an idiosyncratic problem and just because I caught the flu, not everyone in the room has caught the flu. And so to make sure that people understand there is no need to be concerned about all banks if you've got one bank. So, but for me, the moratorium tool is not the solution to funding and resolution. It is just the tool that could bridge between failing and likely to fail and be it the weekend for the resolution decision, or be it the one day more you need to have your solution in place. On funding and resolution, and you combined it with ELA, I would pass on, there are two central bankers, that's for them. Any other reactions yeah. to this question? Uh, well, I will let you okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, moratorium is in the toolbox of the supervisor, it's in the toolbox of the resolution uh, provider. And uh, how they use it, uh, it's part of their responsibility. It is also a tool that can be quite disruptive. If uh, you have your electricity shut off because you don't pay your electricity bill at the end of the month because there's a moratorium, you don't feel very amused. But this is uh, just uh, uh, a joke. Uh, I think it is an important instrument that should be at the disposal of both sides uh, of uh, failing and likely to fail, as Elke has said. But it is a, a tool that should not be extended over too lengthy a period because it can also have negative effects uh, for the economy at large and especially for the individual. But uh, as central bankers, uh, we have issued uh, an opinion that we accept it as under the condition that it is not too long. Uh, just uh, as uh, central bankers, uh, we have uh, very clearly said um, what is ELA, and uh, this is on our website, uh, what are the conditions under which ELA can be given, the framework is public. So here too, as long as uh, the conditions and the toolbox are public knowledge. I think that is very important in order, to, in, order, in order also to justify its usage. Yes. 
No, I, I was going to add in a different manner. While that uh, moratorium might be used with, without big problems for the small banks, which are not uh, having, uh, which are not very interconnected. Yes. For big banks, which they have a lot of interconnectivity, or, or interconnectivity with other banks, yeah. mm -hmm. the problems for the payment system, the security settlement systems that could accumulate f over a couple of days could be so huge that uh, maybe that's a tool that it should be in the toolbox, but uh, to be applied, it has to be taken into consideration, which will be the negative results of yeah. that. So probably it will be uh, uh, worth to make an effort to solve that without asking for a moratorium in certain cases. In other countries, particularly perhaps I would say in Spain, uh, we have, a, let's say, a collective memory and we remember something called Corralito. And that is very negative and the mm. contagion uh, just for that kind of uh, historical memory mm. is, is very high. So, uh, well, as a tool, it's okay to be used under very limited conditions, it, at least in certain cases. And I agree with you, it's a tool that you mo most likely, if you really use it for small to mid-sized banks, I can't imagine a GSIP being under moratorium that would be just. Could I just yeah. complement this, talking about liquidity? I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about liquidity around the fourth moment, just before or just after. I think another issue that, that we, have, we have observed is, is really problematic when it comes to breaking the link between the sovereign and, and the banking system is the uh, uh, provision of uh, state aid uh, in the form of liquidity well before uh, uh, the failing mm -hmm. of a bank. Uh, this is allowed under the banking union rules, but uh, thanks to the SSM's willingness to provide now a forward-looking solvency test, we will base ourselves on that assessment so that this route uh, will be uh, closed down. Uh, and I think empirically this is really extremely important Absolutely. because what we have seen is that many banks that arrive at Elke's, uh, that would arrive at Elke's desk eventually, uh, in terms of their liability structure, only have uh, 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 state-owned uh, uh, liabilities or state-guaranteed liabilities, in which case uh, the uh, bailing in uh, uh, of uh, 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 creditors uh, becomes uh, a fairly meaningless thing and, uh, and, and the the link between the bank and the sovereign is actually re-established through, through, through liquidity. So I think empirically this is something that is that is critical and we're together with the SSM mm. closing it now. We are at the end, it's a fascinating discussion. Uh, uh, thank you very much to, mm. to all, all four panelists. Uh, thank you. Okay.